honourable guests, directors of the Athens Centre, Mr. Zervos and Mrs. Donnelly, dear colleagues and students, it is with great honour and joy that I attempt to speak to you today about a very interesting topic in my view, that of understanding of Afric poetry through the lens of historical intertextuality and linguistic continuity. I wish to thank the director, Mr. Zervos, for his very kind words and invitation, as well as the centre and its people for their hospitality and helpfulness throughout the process of organising this lecture, and especially Ms. Katerina Zafir. Constantine P. Kavafi is considered an ecumenical poet. He has been translated in many languages, including par excellence the English language. He has influenced many modern poets like T.S. Eliot, Ian Forster, and the Greek poet George Sferis. And while his poetry begins in the late 19th century, until today, more than a hundred years after his poetic creation, it continues to inspire and charm its modern readers. In universities around the world, Kavafi's poetry, poetry is avidly translated and studied by professors and students. It is noteworthy that the University of Michigan's Chair of Modern Greek Studies is named after C.P. Kavafi. In order to delve deeper into my analysis, I shall start by defining the term of historical intertextuality. The term intertextuality was coined by the scholar Julia Christopher in the 1960s, although it refers uh, to a practice that goes back many centuries earlier. According to this theory, every author is a potential reader, <coughs> therefore influenced by other texts prior to his own poetic creation. World literature is full of examples of intertextual influence. Namely, for the purposes of this lecture, I will mention Jane Joyce's well-known novel, Ulysses. Having analysed briefly the term of historical sexuality, we may now move on to the tool of linguistic continuity, or to use another term, language change. The scope of my language change analysis will be to compare words in terms of their usage and in terms of their meaning in order to distinguish between three separate categories of words. Those that are used by Homer and their meaning has remained unchanged until the 20th century version of our modern language, like the word cleo. Words that are used in our modern language but with a different meaning already from the 20th century, like for example the word thymos. Words that have changed in modern Greek due to translation by the poet or because they do not exist, even though their semantic value may still remain accessible by educated audiences. In order to understand and analyse the aforementioned language changes, I mainly focused on three sources. Homer's 8th century BCE epic, The Iliad, Ioannis Tetzi's 12th century CE scholarly work, Allegories of the Iliad, and Kavafi's 20th century poem, Forces of Achilles. There's no sufficient evidence to suggest that Kavafi was aware of the text of Ioannis Zetis. However, the text of Zetis acts as a focal point between the ancient and the modern form of the Greek language, and hence it helps us greatly as we attempt to understand its continuity and its diagonally. I have also tried to talk about the sociolinguistic context of all three works of poetic literature with the aim of providing a better understanding of who was the audience in all three cases and therefore who was in part responsible for the use of high language by the author or poet in each separate case. I'll now move on to my first source which is Homer. This is a Roman 
bust of Homer, which uh, has been replicated and can be found in many museums around the world, um, including the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and I'm aware of that particular uh, copy. So let me now say two words about the poet himself and about his art. Homer's Iliad was probably created around the 8th century BC, somewhere in the Ionian region. And I'm going to try to point to the map, which I have right here. This is the region of Ionia. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, as you see, it's really close to the Aegean Sea, and it borders the islands of Hios, Lesbos, and Samos. And of course, we have several candidates for um, the birthplace of Homer, namely Eos, Eos, Smyrna, and the Force of Colophon. Regarding the author, we know that he was a rhapsodist, a word coming from the verb rapto, meaning to weave, and referring to his artistic method. His profession signifies a wandering poet who was especially esteemed at the time, as seen from the example of Phemius, who had a place as a singer at the palace of Ithaca, as we see in Book 1 of the Odyssey, lines 325-327. We should mention here that there is a direct correlation between Homer's profession and his epic creation in a society that praises heroes. As a rhapsodist, his purpose is to sing about the glorious deeds of warriors, or clea and throne, as they are mentioned in the original text. I could, of course, use the Erasmian pronunciation and mention um, clea and throne as clea and throne, but I prefer the Greek, the modern Greek pronunciation, for that matter. Uh, that uh, phrase is found in Iliad Book 9, line 189. Homer's work is presented, as I said before, in palaces, and therefore it refers to the upper class of its time. But it is additionally a work presented during festive occasions at city squares and villages. Thus, it is also a part of a Greek song culture uh, which is much more accessible by larger audiences. The fact that it is presented to kings and the upper class enforced the need of its creator to present models of heroic behavior which could inspire ethically. Although it refers to the elite, we may not say that the Homeric text is a form of high language. It is simply a form of poetic language. This happens because a distinction between high and standard language does not exist at the time of Homer. Another occasion, though, is experienced by Ioannis Tetis, a 12th century grammarian who also presents his work to a very selective audience, namely Princess Irini of the Comnenian court. As we also see from the example of Cavafy, both of the latter two authors deliberately use a very elaborate, high form of language to suit the preferences of their selective audience. In terms of language, it is also valuable to note that according to scholars like Jacqueline de Romilly, who studied the Iliad extensively, Homer tries to remove unnecessary descriptions in order to illustrate only what's most humane and basic with regards to emotions. Let me now move on to the 12th century version of the Iliad that we're going to be looking at today, which is the source from the work by Johannes Zetis, Allegories of the Iliad. In early 12th century, the Bavarian princess Bertha von Sulzbach arrives in Constantinople in order to marry the Byzantine emperor Manuel Komnenos. Interestingly, Cavafy has also written a poem about Manuel Komnenos, which shows his keen interest in this particular historical period. <coughs> Upon her marriage, the Bavarian princess eventually receives the Greek name Irene. 
The future empress wanted to learn more about the Greek culture and language and commissioned Ioannis Tetis, an infamous scholar and grammarian of her time, to become her private tutor and compose for her his own version of the Iliad. Zedzis eventually was able to compose a lengthy 15-syllable poem in 24 books, reflecting the original division of the epic by Alexandrian scholars. We should also note that because Zedzis attempts a didactic explanation of pagan ancient Greek literature and culture to Orthodox Christians, his reworking of the Iliad is also interwoven with Christian allegorical explanations, as well as moral teachings that apply also to the needs of the larger Christian audience of his time, even though, as I mentioned earlier, his work was specifically composed for Empress Irene. A clear example of this is when he translates Zeus, for example, as Zeus and destiny, or when he says that the horses were not immortal, but that their excellence was immortal. Appropriating pagan examples within the Christian context and paradigm of his era was something common at his period of time, as we also see from the examples of Ioannis Diakonos Elinos and Manuel Pselos, to name two other examples of authors who used a similar method. What we see here is a, a, a fresco of Empress Irene, and right next to her, um, depiction of Manu Komnenos. The manuscript that you see is a commentary on Hesiod by Zetis, and it is also um, attested um, that uh, it dates back to the 12th century. Let us now move on to the Kavathic poem and an analysis of the author of the poem himself. As Kavafi mentions in his unpublished autobiography, although his descent was from Constantinople, he was born in Alexandria. It can also be inferred from his cosmopolitan background and from what he mentions that he was poetically influenced by the years he spent in England, Greece and France. He mentions that he knows English, French and a little Italian, and this, I believe, sheds light to the influence of extraterritorial poetry in his work, but also to the particular audience that he could relate with. We know from other scholars like Apostolidis that Kavafi presented his poems to an elite upper-class Greek-speaking audience, well-versed in both ancient and modern Greek, but also aware of Western literature and culture, such as, for example, the works of Dante, Gustave Moreau, and T.S. Eliot, all of which were known to Kavafi, as we know from his personal letter correspondence with writers of his time, like Ian Forster. We also know that he mostly presented his poems in Alexandria. So let us now have a look at modern-day Alexandria, the modern-day port of Alexandria, along with uh, two stanzas from uh, a song by Leonard Cohen, um, Alexandra Living, which is intertextually inspired by Kadath. So this is the cosmos, the microcosm, if you like, of Sipi Kavafi. Let's now look at his larger prism, his macrocosm, his macrocosmos. This is uh, the world under the prism of Hellenistic history after the scholarly theories of Troism. And it is the world that Kavafi had in mind when he composed these historical poems. You can see most of his historical poems are in the board right now. And you can see the uh, span of this map, beginning from the Aegean, extending to areas of Bactria, modern-day Afghanistan, but also areas of Egypt and sub-Saharan Africa. Let me now proceed by talking about the source of Kavafi's poetic inspiration and about the mythos that comes around it. 
the selected Homeric extract under consideration is derived from Book 17 of the Iliad, famously portraying the immortal horses of Achilles cry over the death of Patroclus, and Zeus, the father of the Olympian pantheon, feeling repentant of having bestowed them upon the occasion of the royal wedding of Peleus and Thetis, parents of Achilles. From a psychoanalytic standpoint, we may note at this point that because Cavafy generally has a pessimistic outlook toward life, it somehow becomes easier for him to associate his emotions with the immortal horses of Homer. Those horses, which have also been immortalized in other great works of art, like the painting of Henri Regnault, are free from sin and bear no blame for the calamities of war, which are the result of human egoism and passion. Yet they must suffer in war, following their commander's will. And it is exactly this tragic fate of theirs that inspires Kavafi. Moreover, the affection Kavafi shows to animals is widely observed in his work. We may additionally say that since antiquity, horses were symbols of nobility and aristocracy, as seen from the fact that in 6th century BCE, Athens, and according to the lawgiver Solon, Epis or equestrians represented the second highest aristocratic class according to his system of social stratification and classification. You can see here uh, 6th century sculptures of Epis from the Museum of the Acropolis. At this point, I would like to invite to the podium Mr. Apostolidis, a classical philologist and scholar who has specialized, among others, in Hellenistic history and culture, as well as Kavafic poetry, to read for us the Greek passages of our sources. I will begin by reading the English version, and Mr. Apostolidis will continue in Greek. You may also look at your appendixes. We're going to start with appendix one. And hot tears ever flowed from their eyes to the ground as they wept in longing for their charioteer. And their rich manes were befooled streaming from beneath the yoke pad, beside the yoke, on this aid and on that. And as they, mount, as they mourned, the son of Cronos had sight of them, and was touched with pity, and he shook his head, and thus spake unto his own heart. Ah, unhappy pair, wherefore gave we you to King Peleus, to a mortal, while ye are ageless and immortal? Του ύπου μυρωμένου δε η λέει σε κρονία, τη σκοτεινή και άδειλο ω έφυγε η μαρμένη. Και κεφαλή μου κοινή σα από σε αυτήν η ρίκη. Άθλη η δε δόκα με νημά θνητό πηλαίει. Τεσσαρετέ αθάνατον την μνήμη και εκτιμένου, ή να διστίνω έκτορη θνητό εποχηθείτε. This was the extract um, from passage by Ioan Stetis, but in order to keep the flow of the lecture, I'm going to read the English translation of the passage by Ioannis Tetis, in other words, Appendix 2, and we're going to read the Homeric uh, Appendix 1. Oh, right. oh, oh, okay. So we can have another reading. The other side. Okay. Δάκρυα δέσφη θερμά καταβλεφάρων χαμάδης, ρε μυρωμένησιν ημιόχιο πόθο. Θαλερή δε μιένε το χέτι, 
τη έβριλη εξελικούσα παραγωγών αμφωτέρωθεν. Μυρωμένο δάρα, τόγια ειδών ελέησε κρονίων. Κοινή σα δεκάρι πρωτίον μυθίσα το θυμόν. Α, δειλό, τη σφόη δόμεν πηλή η άνακτη, θνητό ημί δεστών αγύρω τα θανάτωτε. <laughs> so this was Appendix 1, the Homeric Passage, Book 17, lines 436-443. I'm now going to read the Appendix 2, which is the passage from work by Anastasis Allegri's Ophelia in the English translation. The son of Kronos, dark and unknown destiny, as I said, took pity on the weeping horses, and, shaking its head, it said to itself, Wretched ones, why did we give you to mortal Peleus, who will be eternally, you, who will be eternally remembered for your excellence, so that you may be mounted by the ill-fated mortal Hector? <laughs> Του ύπου μυρωμένου δε η λέει σε κρονίων, η σκοτεινή και άδειλο άδυ, ω έφυνη μαρμένη. Και κεφαλήν κοινή σα άπρο σε αυτήν η ρίκη, άθλιοι τι δε δόκαμεν οι μάστινοι τόποι λέει, τεσσαρετέ αθάνατον την μνήμη και εκτιμένου, ή να αντιστείνω έκτορη θνητό εποχηθείτε. Ευάφη himself, the poem, <coughs> the horses of Achilles. When they saw Patroclus dead, so brave and strong, so young, the horses of Achilles began to weep. Their immortal nature was upset deeply by the work of death they had to look at. They reared their heads, tossed their long manes, beat the ground with her hooves and mourned. Patroclus, seeing him lifeless, destroyed, now mere flesh only, his spirit gone, defenseless, without breath, turned back from life to the great nothingness. Zeus saw the tears of those immortal horses and felt sorry. At the wedding of Peleus, he said, I should have never acted so, acted so thoughtlessly, Better if I hadn't given you as a gift, my unhappy horses. What business did you have down there among pathetic human beings, the toys of fate? You are free of death. You will not get old. Yet ephemeral disasters torment you. Men have caught you up in their misery. But it was for the eternal disaster of death that those two gallant horses Shed the tears. Άλογα του Εκκλέου. Τον Πάτροκλο, αν ήταν σκοτωμένο, ήταν τόσο ανδρείο και δυνατό και νέο, και σαν τα λόγα να κλέφτει του Αχυλαίο. Η φύση στον Ιαθάνατη αγανακτούσε για το θανάτου αυτό το έργο που θορούσε. Τίναζαν τα κεφάλια των και τις μακρύες χέτες πουνούσαν, την γη χτυπούσαν με τα πόδια και θρυνούσαν τον Πάτροκλο που ενιώθανε άψυχο αφανισμένο, μια σάρκα τώρα από τα πή, το πνεύμα του χαμένο, ανυπεράσπιστο, χωρίς πνοή, στο μεγάλο τίποτα, επιστραμμένο από την ζωή. Τα δάκρυα είδεν ο ζεύς των αθανάτων, ρόγων και υπήθη. Στου πηλαίο στον γάμο είπε: Δεν έπρεπε έτσι άσκεπτα να κάμω. Καλύτερα να μην σα δίναμε άλλο γάμο δυστυχισμένα. Τι γυρεύατε εκεί, χάμου στην άθλια ανθρωπότητα που είναι το παίγνιο τη μοίρα. Εσεί που δε ο θάνατο φυλάγει, που δε το γύρα, πρόσκαιρε συμφορέ σα τυρανούν. Στα πάσανά του σα έμπλεξαν οι άνθρωποι. Όμω τα δάκρυά των για του θανάτου την παντοτινή, την συμφορά ανεχίνανε τα δυο, τα ζώα, τα ευγενή.
Thank you very much, Mr. Postlit. Let me now proceed by talking about the source the three sources themselves and about how linguistically may derive meaning from comparison between the sources. I will attempt a linguistic analysis of word changes within the three passages, therefore. Let me begin by saying that in line 438, Homer uses a dual number because he is referring to two horses, as you can see. He uses the term miromeno to, while Zedzis, in Appendix 2, uses a simpler form and applies the plural, stating miromenis. The verb mirome, meaning the act of mourning, is here used by Kavafi in its modern Greek use when he says klene in line three to denote that the horses were in fact crying and in order to translate what he means. Kavafi himself further uses this verb in one of his other poems entitled Omiris. Earlier in the Homeric extract, in lines 426, 427, which are not available in your extract, we find the phrase epicleon. I just want to mention this in relation to the reference of the, the word kleo in Homer himself. This is the imperfect tense of the verb kleo without augmentation, e which is similarly used in modern Greek. In his poem, Kavafi says that the horses started to cry sometime in the past, but that continued giving duration to the act of crying. As you can see in Appendix 3, this is conveyed very drastically when he says, What Homer says, used in a non-augmented and perfect time, type, must be translated in many more words by Kavafi in modern Greek. That shows that language in the past had the tendency of being more condensed while at the same time maintaining its semantic value fully. Moving on to Tetis, we also see the use of the past participle quite often, something that means that the syntax of Tetis is much closer to the ancient text of Homer. In fact, his syntax is closer also to the Attic syntax as we can see comparing his text with other sources like Thucydides and Plato. Again, this type of syntax and morphological choice helps us to formulate condensed phrases that are full of meaning, which is something very difficult to translate in one word in the modern Greek 19th century version that Kavafi uses in his poetry. The word kara found in Homer's text in Appendix 1 exists in modern Greek as a kara in an ecclesiastical context. It is mentioned as kefali in Zedzis and as kefali in Kavafi, which is, we may also note here, a more simplified version in its modern form and one closer to its Byzantine counterpart. I would like to especially stress this point of my speech. We have the, the word vilos in the Homeric text. Already from Homer's time, that word can be translated both as, ca as a coward and as a person who is worthy of mercy. However, according to the particular context here, Zedzis, as a grammarian and scholar of Homeric Greek, knows that the word should be translated as athios. But in the sense of worthy of mercy, and Kavafi, in his reworking of the Iliadic passage, uses the word dystichismena, or miserable, to denote the physical and psychological state in which the horses find themselves once they are deemed worthy of mercy. Today, the word athlios also has the meaning of villainous, and the word vilos means coward. But Kavafi 
sensitive to approaching the original meaning of what Homer might have meant, chooses a different word in order to preserve its original nuance in his time and era. This is a very important observation because it shows that Cavafy himself wanted his readers to have also had some kind of linguistic knowledge and understanding of the etymologies um, in a diachronic fashion. Additionally, we may note that the phrase katathimon in Homer means to himself. The word thimos has been preserved as a word, but its meaning has changed quite a lot. In Homer, the word means the psyche, the heart, one's opinion, and even one's courage, as we see from the extract in Book 6, when uh, um, Hector responds to Andromache. Both Tetis and Kavafi avoid using his word, avoid using this word because the meaning of this word has rapidly changed at the time. In both Tetis and Kavafi, the word would eventually mean wrath if it were used, and hence it is purposefully omitted. Finally, the phrase on Nifisato Simon in Homer means he said to himself, and Zedis translates this whole phrase with the pluperfect tense of the verb lego as iriki, since the verb nifeo me is synonymous to lego in his time. While moving on to Kavafi, we see that since in his own time the word nifeo me doesn't exist, he completely avoids a word choice and instead uses a colon and a quotation mark to provide the same feeling in his modern reworking of the Homeric verse. In conclusion, we may note that every author speaks the language of his time. All three authors write in poetic language, which is a form of high language as it differs significantly from the standard spoken language. <coughs> Since there is such a time distance between the three authors, it is expected that there would be differences in form and word choice, even though both Tzedis and Kavafi deal with Homer's passage. It is interesting to see that many words have changed when others have remained the same until their modern use, showing the continuity of the Greek language. Once again, Kavafi elevates us with his wings in the heights of his own poetic imagination. Those of history, love of the good and noble, Okalokarathon, those of philosophy through poetic language. He breathes into the lungs of an ancient language a new psyche which lives anew and reinvigorates our senses. He sheds light to every ancient detail, making it modern and timeless. Like a careful archaeologist who finds the remnants of an ostrich or a fossilized seed, and who tries, with what little information he possesses, to recreate the ancient past, so too we find the renaissance of myth and the mythic methods in Kavafi who makes the distant figures of the past our own, our most familiar. Although he might simply be focusing on horses, he yet charismatically stimulates our most noble emotions and our most humane empathy. It is for that reason that his poetry has something grand and timeless. It is for that reason that Cavafi truly has achieved the ecumenical. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.